everyone, so I did a recent video on torque wrenches comparing the accuracy of a budget wrench and a nice Park Tool one. And while I thought the test was conceptually sound, Park Tool themselves actually reached out and pointed out that this type of test where you hang a fixed weight at different lengths along the torque wrench handle is fundamentally flawed for click style torque wrenches. They even pointed me to a video of theirs that demonstrates the variability of applied torque when changing the grip position on the handle using a direct measurement strain gauge torque sensor. In short, I was schooled. Anyways, I had a hard time wrapping my head around the results in the park video because textbook physics seems like such a direct application in this context. Namely, that the applied torque is simply a product of the moment arm and the perpendicular force applied. But the park video, along with a handful of others, seem to directly contradict the math through experimental findings. So after a lot of critical thinking, I emerged with an explanation for why grip position on a click style torque wrench actually does matter, and I have the math to show it. In this video, should you choose to continue, we'll do a deep-ish dive on the physics behind torque wrenches, and I'll explain the underlying mathematical mechanism for why grip position does actually matter in click type torque wrenches, and I'll try and offer some additional insights along the way. Okay, so first, zooming way out, we should all be aware that there are different types of torque wrenches available. Now, if you've ever worked in a shop or been around tools, you'll know that there are many different types, including your traditional beam style wrenches, digital torque wrenches, and of course, the very popular click style torque wrench, like the ones that I was comparing in my last video. But perhaps what you didn't know, and something that I only recently learned, is that some types of wrenches are what are referred to as length dependent torque wrenches, meaning that where you hold your handle on the wrench actually changes the applied torque at the bolt. Now, I think this is a part that many people have trouble wrapping their heads around. Now, the general argument against this idea is that, quote, torque is torque, and if you choke up on the handle, it just means that you have to apply more force to achieve the same torque. Now, while this is conceptually factual for a rigid cantilever beam like a standard box wrench, the click style torque wrench is not a simple beam style wrench. And so the fundamental equation for torque being the cross product of the moment arm and the applied force doesn't exactly apply in the traditional sense. Now I knew it had something to do with this pivot point here that you'll find on all click style wrenches, but I couldn't find the actual math to describe it anywhere. Now the closest that I came was simply to look at several owner's manuals for click style wrenches and note the common theme that they all say to apply the force at the middle of the handle. Now, some people have asserted that this is only so you don't somehow damage the wrench handle, but in reality, it's because you'll actually get a different applied torque depending on where you hold the handle. Okay, so diving right in, the internals of a typical click type torque wrench look like this. You have the main socket attachment point or the head of the wrench, and that's part of one long solid beam that extends well into the outer handle. Now the outer handle is basically just a metal cylinder that's attached to the head at this pivot point, which you can see on all click type torque wrenches. Now at the end of the inner beam is some type of mechanical clutch, usually in the form of a ball detent system or something similar, and on the other side is a spring that applies compressive force to the clutch. Now the force of the spring is adjustable by the dial at the end of the handle, which we're all used to, and the more compressed the spring is, the more force it takes to push the inner beam off its perch, or in other words, to disengage the clutch and to yield the audible click sound from the torque wrench that we're all accustomed to. But during normal use, you'd set the torque wrench to a prescribed torque, say five Newton meters, which effectively puts a known and calibrated amount of compressive force on this inner spring. Then when you turn the wrench and continue to increase the amount of applied force, the only thing keeping the outer handle from rotating about the inner beam at the pivot point is the clutch force, which is modeled here as a simple shear force. Then at some point, the clutch can no longer withstand that twisting force anymore, and the inner beam slips off his perch, and that's when you hear and feel the audible click as the outer handle finally rotates about the pivot point and the inner beam strikes the inner wall of the outer handle. Now this is the indication that you've applied the proper torque to the bolt in question. Now, let's suppose for just a moment that hypothetically, we were to move the actual socket attachment point to be coincident with the handle pivot point. I know, but trust me, if you can get through this part, there's a real payoff at the end. Now, as with all rotating systems, the dynamic behavior can be modeled using Newton's second law as a sum of torques equaling the rotational moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. 
Now thankfully, this is actually an engineering statics problem since the system is not actually accelerating during normal use. So what this means is that we can zero out the right side of the equation since the angular acceleration is zero. Now setting an arbitrary direction for positive, we can see that if we apply a perpendicular force at a distance d1 from the pivot point, the resulting torque is positive d1 times f. Now the only reason the outer handle doesn't spin about the pivot point is because there's another torque resisting that motion, this time in the opposite direction, coming from the force at the clutch, which we'll call f of s, times the distance of the inner beam from the pivot point to the clutch, which we'll call r. So the static torque balance equation looks like d1 times f minus r times f of s equals zero, which we can rearrange to look like d1 times f equals r times f of s. Now everything on the right hand side of the equation would have been calibrated by the tool manufacturer to click once the applied torque reaches some threshold value. Now in this particular case, it is true that as long as the product of d1 and f equal that threshold value on the right hand side of the equation, the wrench will indeed click and the proper torque will have been applied to the bolt. For instance, a force of 10 pounds applied at a distance d1 of 5 inches would yield a torque of 50 inch-pounds experienced by the clutch, as well as an applied torque of 50 inch-pounds at the socket, since in this hypothetical scenario, they're at the same point. Now similarly, a larger force of 25 pounds applied at a shorter distance of 2 inches, in other words, choking up on the handle, would yield the same effective torque of 50 inch-pounds, again, at both the clutch and the socket. And of course, it works in the other direction as well. If we apply a smaller force of only 5 pounds at a longer distance of 10 inches, we still see an applied torque of 50 inch-pounds, and in every case here, the wrench will click, and the applied torque at the bolt is the same 50 inch-pounds. Now this is characteristic of non-length-dependent torque wrenches, since it doesn't matter where you hold the torque wrench handle. However, we all know that this is not how a traditional click-type torque wrench works. Namely, that the socket head is not coincident with the handle's pivot point, but rather it's offset by a distance we'll call d2. Now this doesn't change the fundamental governing torque equation, but it does change the numeric values, and critically, the torque felt by the clutch is no longer equivalent to the applied torque at the head. Now let's take a quick look at the static equation of motion for this more representative configuration. Now we still have that the sum of torques should equal zero, but in this case, we'll take the torques about the socket attachment point. Still setting clockwise as a positive direction, we have that when we apply a force on the handle, the corresponding torque is equal to the moment arm, now equal to d1 plus d2 times f. And again, part of the torque that resists this twisting motion comes from the internal clutch, which is effectively a torque in the opposing direction equal to r times the calibrated clutch force f of s. Now, looking closely at this more representative scenario, the critical conceptual point to be made is that the calibrated clutch torque is still taken with reference to the handle pivot point Q because that's where the rotation point is for the handle. But the applied torque at the socket head is taken with respect to point O, which is of course where the socket actually connects. Now the torque balance in this equation is preserved due to an additional couple acting on the system resulting from the reaction forces at the head and the pivot point, which we can lump together and model as an effective moment, which we'll call M sub C. So now, Let's suppose that the offset distance between the socket head and the handle pivot point is d2 equals 1 inch. And also suppose we apply a perpendicular force of 10 pounds at a distance d1 of 5 inches. The torque that the clutch experience is actually just d1 times f, or 50 inch pounds, as in the previous fictitious scenario, while the applied torque at the bolt is now the moment arm d1 plus d2 times f, or 60 inch pounds. Now this discrepancy itself isn't a problem. In fact, the tool manufacturers calibrate this discrepancy so that when you do apply the force at say d1 equals 5 inches, you actually get the proper applied torque denoted on the dial. The problem here is that when you change your grip position, the applied torque at the bolt changes even though the wrench still clicks at the same torque setting. To see this, let's now suppose we really choke up on the handle at a distance d1 of only 2 inches. Now of course we'll have to apply a larger force to get the wrench to click, this part is intuitive. Now in this case a force of 25 pounds will apply the same torque at the clutch of 50 inch pounds and consequently the wrench will still click just as it did in the previous scenario. 
But the applied torque at the socket is again D1 plus D2, or three inches now, times the applied force of 25 pounds for an effective applied torque at the socket of 75 inch pounds, which is much greater than the 60 inch pounds in the previous example. And remember, in both cases, the wrench still clicked at the exact same dial setting. Now this of course works in the opposite direction as well. If we were to extend the handle and apply a smaller force of only five pounds at a distance of 10 inches, again, we still see an effective torque at the clutch of 50 inch pounds. And once again, the wrench will click, but critically, the actual applied torque at the socket is D1 plus D2 or 11 inches this time, times the smaller applied force of five pounds for an applied torque at the socket of only 55 inch pounds. Now in every one of these cases, the wrench would have clicked because the torque experienced at the clutch was the same in all scenarios. But also in every case, a different torque at the socket was actually applied. Now this took me a while to wrap my head around and even longer to find a good way to explain it, rigorously with actual math and physics that is. But I think I finally see it and I hope you do too. Now this is the reason that all videos performing accuracy tests on click type wrenches by sliding a fixed weight around to different locations on the wrench handle are fundamentally flawed. And this includes the very video that I posted comparing a budget wrench to a nice park tool wrench. Now you have to keep in mind that this is the reason that manufacturers calibrate their wrenches according to an applied force at a prescribed distance from the pivot point, usually in the middle of the handle. Now, by the way, in my previous comparison video, I incorrectly came to the conclusion that the park tool wasn't as accurate as I expected, precisely because I was using this flawed testing procedure. Now, all I can do at this point is apologize to park tool. You are absolutely right, but I am happy to report that my math agrees with your experimental findings, and upon retesting with the force applied at the proper point in the middle of the handle, I have confirmed that the park wrench is perfectly accurate. Now, I don't have a digital strain gauge torque sensor like in the park video, but I'd be more than happy to collaborate with anyone who does to see if my math agrees with the experimental results for a prescribed set of parameters. Whew. Anyways, if you made it this far in this video, thank you first of all, and also I apologize if your brain is now fried. This channel is supposed to be informative and entertaining, and no one but the nerdiest of nerds should have to go through this type of analysis to convince themselves of a somewhat innocuous result. So go for a bike ride maybe, it'll help to clear your head. All right, so that's gonna wrap it up for this nerdy deep dive video. I hope this helps to clear up the confusion surrounding grip position on click type length dependent torque wrenches. If you have any questions or if you found any errors in my math, feel free to discuss down below. I'm always open to constructive criticism. Now, if you're convinced by my derivation here, you can also feel free to send this video around to others who believe that torque is torque, but you know, do it nicely and embrace the academic debate. Thanks again for watching and thanks again for subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time.